I'm hearing the feed.
Hello everyone and welcome to the July Recreational Astronomy Night meeting of the RASC Toronto Centre. My name is Paul Markov and I'll be your host for this evening. And uh, we are live in front of uh, an audience, 20 people or so here at the Ontario Science Centre tonight. And uh, to our online viewers, a reminder that um, uh, we have resumed uh, in-person meetings at the Science Centre. So if you can, please join us here next month. Uh, for those of you who cannot make it here ever <laughs> for various reasons, uh, we'll still uh, continue broadcasting these uh, meetings uh, through uh, YouTube. Um, and that's uh, because of the great work done by our AV team uh, that's made up of uh, Andrew and Betty Reed. Uh, we have Ward Legro, and uh, not here tonight, but uh, they typically help is Enya Chalucci and Reza Mohammed as well. Um, as you know, I'm always on the lookout for presentations for future meetings. Uh, fortunately, the August meeting is full, uh, but we have openings for the September uh, meeting and also meetings beyond that. Uh, and, uh, as you may know, our meetings happen on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, let's see, the uh, presenters for this evening's are three as usual, and we have Andy Beaton presenting the sky this month. Uh, we have uh, Matteo Statti uh, talking to us about the mystery of the Marsh telescope. Uh, he's actually brought uh, a large five inch refracting telescope here um, at uh, the meeting. And uh, then we'll have uh, Arnold Brody talk to us about uh, the Artemis lunar mission, uh, a review and a look ahead. Uh, Tom Luton, our president, will uh, wrap up the meeting with announcements uh, as usual, and uh, we should be done later than 9.30 this evening. Um, if you are uh, watching us online and you have a question for one of the speakers, uh, please uh, ask it through the chat box, and uh, Ward will ask the question to the speaker on your behalf. Uh, in the room, uh, if you have a question, put up your hand, and I'll come by with a microphone. It's important you speak into the microphone so folks online can hear your question. And um, a show of hands, do we have anyone here for the first time, whether you're a member or not? Anyone? No? Yes, right here. Okay, very good. Welcome. Thank you. And if you're watching us online for the first time uh, as well, please let us know through the chat box. So let's get the meeting started uh, with uh, Andy and this guy this month. Hello, uh, my name's Andy Beaton. You have probably seen me do this uh, a few times. For those who haven't, I'm an amateur astronomer who lives and observes in downtown Toronto. If you want to know what it's like observing 50 feet from a streetlight, I'm the person you can ask. So I get to do the sky this month for this month. And we uh, have my usual list of uh, favorite subjects, the big picture, key dates, Moon, planets, something in the deep sky, a double star, a variable star, and whatever is happening in the world of space flight. So starting with the big picture, if you're out tonight, by the time the meeting's over, you get home, you set up your telescope, 1045 is a reasonable time. This is what you should be seeing. You should be seeing a few, star, a few planets out there, our, uh, Spring constellations are sinking into the west, but we can see Venus and uh, Mars just above the horizon there. Venus, you'll see a lot of it because uh, it's visible well before twilight. Uh, we have a few minor planets uh, visible. Um, Ceres is probably visible to uh, a normal human being with their telescope. Uh, the other guys, they're there for academic interest. By the time we get around to our next meeting, uh, 4.30 in the morning of that day, when we look to the east before sunrise, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see all the planets you can stand. We've got Saturn, we've got Jupiter, we've got uh, Uranus and Neptune out there. There'll be a full moon for the next meeting or something very close to it. And we'll get all our favorite summer constellations there, and a few of our favorite fall constellations uh, showing up uh, just before sunrise. And if you take a look right in the bottom left corner of the picture, there's Orion sticking his nose up, sign that uh, winter's going to come eventually. So nights are getting longer. Uh, this is good news for uh, us, bad news for people who like staying out late on patios. Astronomical twilight is going to end 
20 after 11 tonight and start again at uh, 250 in the morning. This is all uh, daylight savings time. So you don't have a big window for your long exposures. Um, by the end of the, uh, the month, it'll be more like 1030 when things get dark and uh, 345 when things are light enough to get in the way. Important dates. The important date, of course, is the new moon, July 17th. That's where we're going to get our best sky. Uh, moon is at apogee, which is far, and perig on July 20th, perigee, which is close, on August 2nd. Uh, interesting project I always like to uh, suggest is take pictures of the moon at those two dates and compare them. You can actually see a difference in size, which gives you a rough idea of how uh, eccentric the moon's orbit is. Full moon on August 1st. It's not the superest moon we're going to get this uh, year, but it's pretty super. It's pretty big and close. It'll be very bright. If you've got uh, friends and family who are easily intrigued by this kind of thing, uh, tell them about it. Um, people love supermoons. Uh, Venus will be minus 4.7 magnitude on July 7th. Uh, you're going to not be able to miss it. You'll probably see it through clouds. And we have a meteor shower showing up the uh, South Delta Aquarians in uh, late July. So the moon, uh, first quarter on the 25th, uh, full moon on August 1st, uh, last quarter on July 10th, and the new moon on the 17th. Um, July 25th, we have the appearance of a lunar X. And what we have there is uh, two craters side by side on the moon. And when uh, the sunlight hits them at a certain angle, it looks like there's an X on the moon. It doesn't mean anything scientifically, but it's cool. And it's a good excuse to uh, haul your telescope out and have a look at the moon. Uh, July 26th is the appearance of the lunar straight wall. It's a long straight feature on the moon. And when it's illuminated at a certain angle, it uh, shows up very beautifully. So we got planets. Uh, Mercury will be showing up in the uh, evening later in the month. Right now, it's just getting past the sun. Uh, Venus is insanely bright. It's uh, as bright as you'll ever see it. It's up to, I say, minus 4.7. It'll be brighter than any planes you see flying around. You won't be able to mistake it. Uh, Mars is uh, going to be a disappointment. Um, people who are desperate to see Mars will be able to see it, but it's not going to be showing any detail. You're not going to see any surface features or ice caps. It's too far away and too low in the sky by the time it gets dark enough to see it. Jupiter. Yeah. If that's not everybody's favorite planet, it's your second favorite planet. Uh, rises just after midnight. Um, anything before dawn in the morning, you're going to have a spectacular view of it. Saturn is rises a bit earlier. It'll rise before midnight. And it'll be more or less in the same part of the sky throughout the entire month. Uh, unfortunately, the rings are closing compared to last year, and it'll be closed more closed next year so if you want to see the rings at their best um, you're going to have to wait for the cycle to go through but uh, get out and see them now while they're still better than they're going to be uranus and neptune the ice giants um, uranus is in aries it rises a bit before jupiter in the morning so you'll be able to see it uh, without any morning observing session uh, Neptune rises a bit after midnight. Um, both of those planets are going to be as good as they usually are for viewing. They're on the right side of the sun. They're, if they're not the closest they're going to be, they're pretty close, and uh, you'll have a pretty good view of them. Uh, if you're looking for Neptune, uh, try for Neptune's uh, brightest moon, Triton. Uh, anything larger than an 8-inch telescope should be able to manage it with decent skies. There's always a typo in my presentation. This says planetary highlights, and it should say dwarf planetary highlights. Uh, Pluto's in Capricornus. Um, it's getting away from the Milky Way. 
It's at opposition on July 22nd. If uh, it's your ambition to see Pluto, this is the best time to do it. Uh, it'll be around well into the fall, but uh, this is going to be as bright and close as it gets. Ceres, uh, the big asteroid in Virgo, uh, it sets by midnight, but uh, at 7.5 magnitude, it's a you should be able to see it with a pair of binoculars under most conditions. And it's moving around fast enough that it's an interesting project to uh, track. Uh, get a sky map, print it out, uh, and mark it uh, day to day and see the asteroid moving around the, the, its orbit. I always like to uh, throw in a bit of deep sky stuff. Um, this month I've picked M27, the Dumbbell Nebula a large planetary nebula in uh, this constellation Volpecula. Um, it looks more like an alpha core to me. I think it was named by someone with a lousy telescope because the cheaper your telescope, the more it looks like a dumbbell. The better your telescope, the more it looks like an apple. See here, that's, that looks more like an apple to me than a dumbbell. Under dark skies, you can see it with binoculars. But uh, the more aperture you throw at it, the more spectacular it gets. What we're looking at here is a shell of gas being expelled by a dying star. This is the probable fate of our sun once it uh, runs out of fuel. So if you want a sneak preview of uh, what we're going to see in another you know, 10 billion years or so, uh, this is your big chance. And I'll throw in a plug for Messier certificates. It's uh, number 27 on the Messier list. When you've seen them all, you uh, send in your uh, list to the uh, RASC and you get a fancy certificate and a pin and a sense of accomplishment. It's a, a pretty cool project. Now, if you're a more advanced observer, you've seen M27 before, but uh, you may want uh, something more challenging to do with it. Uh, it can be imaged with uh, different narrowband filters, oxygen-3, silicon-2, so is that sulfur or silicon-2? I never remember. Hydrogen-alpha, get different images in different colors and combine them to make fascinating colored images. And with narrowband filters, you can do it in the city. You can look for the 13.6 magnitude central star. Um, I haven't seen it yet. It's just a bit out of reach for my telescope. But uh, anything, say, 10 inches or better, you should be able to see it. And anybody doing imaging, it should be an easy find. There are bright knots in the gas uh, near the edge of the south-southwest lobe. And there's my typo for the uh, presentation. And if you are patient and have a nice dark sky, you can image the faint outer shell. If we take a look at this image here, it doesn't even show up. It's uh, probably double the size of it, very faint, um, and as far as I know, never been seen visually, but it does show up in long images. As always, we've got uh, comets and meteors showing up. Uh, our best meteor shower is the uh, South Delta Aquarius from July 25th to August 2nd. Peaking on the 29th, they're promising us uh, 20 meteors an hour. Um, that's always variable. Uh, unfortunately, it's under a mostly full moon. So you may get uh, lucky and see the bright ones. I wouldn't count on seeing the dim ones. So realistically, I would call that more like uh, five meteors an hour than 20. But what you can always do with meteor showers is uh, set up your shortwave radio, tune it to uh, dead air, and when meteors pass through the upper atmosphere, you can pick up radio stations from thousands of miles away as the radio signal bounces off the ion trail that the uh, meteor leave, leaves behind. We've got some minor showers, the July Pegasids and the Alpha Capricornids. Um, these are small showers looking, you know, three or four meteors uh, an hour. I wouldn't bother going out specifically to look at them, but if you're out observing and you see a meteor coming from a strange direction, um, trace it back to its origin and see if it's one of these uh, minor showers. 
And the meteor dribble is even less. That's maybe one or maybe two meteors per hour. Um, there are lots of uh, these little meteor dribbles. I've just thrown in a couple just so you know that they exist. And if you're out there and observing, you might see one. Comets, it's uh, not a particularly good month for comet looking. Um, E1 Atlas in Ursa Minor is the best one. It's uh, currently 9.6 magnitude and fading. Um, comet uh, T4 Lemon is 10th magnitude in Sculptor. That's for you observers in the Southern Hemisphere only. I was, I was extremely delighted to find there were people uh, listening to me talk from in the Southern Hemisphere and all this Southern Hemisphere information suddenly became useful. Uh, C2020 V2ZTF in Aries, and a couple of dim uh, pan-star comets in Lepus and Pisces. If you're a dedicated uh, comet searcher, they're probably worth tracking down. If you're looking to impress people with a spectacular comet with a long tail, eh, it's not so good. And a couple of months ago, I added in Aurora here because we had been promised a big auroral display, which uh, we got a display of clouds instead around here. But I kept it in here um, just to point out that right now things are pretty quiet on the sun, not a lot of uh, activity. So we're not going to see a lot of spectacular auroras in the immediate future, but there's a whole month of us ahead. So I'm going to point out uh, spaceweather.com. Um, as a source of information for upcoming solar events, um, aurora predictions, and maps where we can expect to see the aurora. Now, uh, as a, inspired by uh, Blake Nancaro, I hope you're out there watching Blake, uh, I've got a double star for you. Uh, Kruger 60, this one's, uh, not an easy one to see. This one's going to take a bit of work. You'll need a telescope for sure. Uh, a 9.9 .9 and 11.4 pair of red dwarfs in Cepheus. Now, what I found interesting about this is it's got a 45-year period. Uh, if you start observing now and keep observing for the next 45 years, you will see them complete an entire orbit. Which means if you're watching from year to year, you're actually going to see movement. You know, I, we've all seen a lot of uh, double stars where there are you know, thousands of astronomical, astronomical units apart and will never get anywhere close to being observing us observing the move. But uh, this one's going to be a really good target. There are currently 2.4 arc seconds apart. That's close but it's not as close as the, uh, the pairs in, uh, in the double-double in Lyra. So it is, it is splittable with a reasonably large telescope. And you want a lot of magnification thrown in there as well. The B star is also a variable star. Every now and then it uh, flares up, doubles in brightness over an eight minute period, and then dims back down again. And it's entirely unpredictable. So if you are going to be out observing and you see that uh, that 11.4th magnitude star is a lot brighter, uh, get onto your uh, computer and uh, report it to the people who need to know. I couldn't uh, do one of these presentations without talking about variable stars. That's my thing. I, I love them. I can't help it. Uh, I picked RR Lyrae uh, this month. Um, it goes from 6.9 to 8 magnitude, and it does it fast. Uh, the period is 0.57 days. It's a, an interesting one from a, a physics point of view. Uh, helium gets ionized by radiation blasting out of the, the star and becomes more and more opaque. So more of the light from the star, the energy from the star, gets trapped inside it. Star heats up and expands. Once it heats up and expands, there's less uh, radiation uh, zapping the helium. The ionization trickles away. The star becomes more transparent. The heat uh, blasts out, and the star collapses again. 
It's uh, interesting scientifically because this is the standard candle for measuring distances to globular clusters. And that's one of the uh, footsteps to measuring the size of the universe. So it's a really important thing for scientists to understand. And in fact, uh, our own Helen Sawyerhog uh, made a career. She founded her career studying RR Lyrae stars in uh, nearby globular clusters. So it would be a tribute to her to uh, go out and see if you can uh, spot some of these guys. Now, as always, the American Association for Variable Star Observers wants your information. They want you to go out and observe this, measure it, and report back your findings. It's quite simple. You uh, download a map. It gives you all the comparison stars nearby. You look at it, you say, OK, it's dimmer than that seventh magnitude star and brighter than that 7.5th magnitude star. It looks like 7.3. That's all there is to it, and you're generating genuine scientific data. So we have another variable star, obviously, SN2023 IXF, which I'm sure you all recognize, or as you, we know it better, the supernova in M101. Uh, currently, it's around 12th magnitude, so it's definitely a telescope object, and it is slowly declining. I think it's gone down half a magnitude over the past few weeks. This is another chance to uh, get some science in and have a look at the brightest supernova we've seen in years. And once again, aavso.org is where you can find all the details, uh, maps of comparison stars, and everything you need. Coming up in spaceflight, um, we're always getting new stuff from JWST. We have an uh, Antares rocket with an ISS cargo payload uh, flying from Wallops Island, Virginia, not California, not Florida. Um, this is a brand new spaceport. Um, if you're observing from the east coast of the US, you probably have a decent chance of seeing this one launch. We have the Japanese X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy mission. Uh, exact date to be determined, but uh, it's on its way up. Uh, more Falcon 9s than you can shake a stick at, and a lot of ISS passes. Uh, we've got evening and morning passes until July 21st, and then it's just evening passes until August the 2nd. Heavensabove.com uh, gives you times and locations for uh, ISS passes according to where you live, because as you can imagine, it doesn't take much of a difference in location to change the times and uh, places in the sky, you'll see the space station. Now, one other thing that was uh, in the news, gravitational waves. Um, I've been observing my weight carefully. I don't think it's been changing a lot. It seems to have changed by at least one in a quadrillion parts due to uh, primordial gravitational waves, uh, which generally seem to be everywhere we look throughout the universe which tells us it's something from very, very early in the uh, universe's uh, life. Um, there, are, there is no confirmed explanation for it yet. The best explanation I've heard is that there are millions of supermassive black hole pairs in the early universe. And as they rotate around each other, they blast off gravitational waves like nobody's business. This is one where you're probably not going to observe it yourself, but it's definitely worth uh, keeping an eye on the, uh, on the internet and see what news is coming out as uh, this weird and interesting phenomena gets studied more. So as it was, what if it's cloudy or the sky is filled with choking clouds of smoke? That's, those have been my choices for the past few months. We have zooniverse.org with a heap of citizen science projects. This is, these are projects where scientists don't have the time to gather all the data for the vast numbers of observations they need to make. They're farming it out to you and I. So you go to the website, pick a project, and start classifying data. Uh, there are dozens of projects I've picked for just because they looked interesting here. Uh, cool Neighbors, a brown dwarf search. Brown dwarves are stars with just not enough uh, mass to ignite. They just have gravitational heat. Redshift Wrangler, measuring redshifts of objects in space. 
fishing for jellyfish galaxies. They're weird galaxies, and you can Google them to find out exactly what they're all about. And cloud spotting on Mars, going to uh, images of Mars, looking for clouds, trying to uh, get a good grip on Martian weather. This is all stuff where you and I are contributing to real science. So if there are any questions, uh, corrections for the typos that I've missed, um, I can be emailed at uh, andy.beaton at gmail, and I'm on uh, a few of the social media places as well. So thank you very much. Do we have questions for Andy in the room? Any questions in the room before we go online? Nothing? Okay. Um, how about online questions? We do. Yes. Uh, just one comment uh, this evening. A, uh, you mentioned southern viewers or people from the southern hemisphere viewing. Yes. Tuning in. We have one uh, from Patagonia, uh, Argentina this evening. Hello, Gustavo. Thank you very much for uh, showing up here. I really appreciate that. All right, that's it for online and we don't have any questions in the room. So thank you again, uh, Andy, great presentation as always. Appreciate the time you put into putting it together and presenting it to us. All right, so uh, we'll go to fun facts for a moment, I think, while we switch over equipment to the next speaker. We'll be right back. Talk to us about the mystery of the Mars te Marsh Telescope. Hello, everyone. My name is Matteo Sadi, and today I'll be talking to you about the mystery of the Marsh Telescope. To begin, we must head on over to the Aberfoyle Antique Market. So, what is the Aberfoyle Antique Market? Well, the Aberfoyle Antique Market is a very large antique showing where many different vendors show up with many different items for sale. Now, you may be asking, why am I talking about such a place? Well, I'll get into that later. While I was there in 2021, I met one of the vendors. His name is John Vanderkop. He is the owner of A1 Antiques, and he is one of the many vendors that are at Aberfoyle. While I was looking at the things he had for sale, I started talking to him, and we ended up bonding together, and I actually ended up volunteering for him several times. During these volunteering shifts, I mentioned how I had a huge interest and passion in astronomy and telescopes. Moving on to June of 2022, 
I was in Nashville, Tennessee for an internship relating to physics and astronomy. When I got a text from John, what what happened was that Aberfill is was doing a special Saturday show where many different or many more vendors showed up with even more items for sale. And it just so happened that one of these vendors had a telescope for sale. And while John was walking around as he was preparing for his own um, for his own booth, he actually saw that telescope. And the first thing he thought of was me. And he texted me about the telescope. And he even sent me a picture. As you can see on the picture on the left, the second I saw it, I was in love and I had to get it. And so after talking to the seller, as well as doing a lot of arrangements, as my parents actually couldn't pick it up, John was actually willing to purchase the telescope for me and hold it temporarily until my parents were able to pick it up. And then I finally became the owner of this telescope. The seller didn't have much to say about it, as he did not remember all the details. But he said he purchased it from a Toronto estate sale, although he doesn't remember exactly where in Toronto it was purchased, as well as whose estate it was. Judging from the pictures, you could see that the telescope is about a five inch diameter and is about six feet long. Moving on to August of 2022, I finally finished my internship. And the first thing, the first thing I did when I got back was to take a look at the telescope. To begin, we could see that the lens was very dirty although there was no scratches, blemishes, or even any mold. So it was actually in a very good condition. It just had to be cleaned. If you look very closely at the top left side of the top picture, you may be able to see a little face. That is because a stamp was actually cut up to use as a spacer to space both lenses in the telescope. In dating this, we could see that it's actually uh, of Edward, King Edward VII and was minted from 1903 to 1908. Moving on, we have two interesting features about the telescope. The first is that the tube is actually painted uh, black over the brass tube. This is something you don't normally see on telescopes. And on top of that, you could see the use of aluminum hardware, which is unlike the time of which telescopes like these were made. So my best guess is that these are replacement parts made by a previous owner. Moving on, we could see that it also came with an eyepiece. And inside of this eyepiece contains one of the only few markings on the telescope. And the number in the, in the markings is just 1.414. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but my best guess is that is actually the focal length of the eyepiece in inches because comparing it to a 25 millimeter eyepiece, which is a bit smaller than 1.4 inches, you could, I was able to notice that this eyepiece had a much wider view. And as a side note, 1.414 is actually the square root of two. So that may pose some significance to, to it. Continuing on, you could see that there is green and gray corrosion on the dew shield. This is typical of old brass. What's also on top of these dew shields are these custom mother dust caps, which are of high quality and very finely stitched. Continuing on to the center of the telescope, you could see there is a very large mounting screws, half an inch in diameter, in fact. And as you could see, see well, not in this picture, but the threading on this is actually very coarse and is unlike anything I could find. And therefore I have to say that this, I believe this is unique threading. Continuing on, I re after removing the cell, the first thing I saw on the lenses were these markings. And I quickly realized these are actually for alignment, both for the lenses to each other, the spacers for the lenses, as well as the lenses to the cell. So some time later, I decided I wanted to clean the telescope because it, it was in a good shape, but there was so much stuff on the lens that it was making me worried that it will be scratched up if I don't do something about it. Unfortunately for me, I have no experience in cleaning refractory telescopes, so I had to look around for someone who could help. And after some time has passed, I found a man named Henry Laparskis. So Henry Laparskis is a volunteer at the Hume Chrome Observatory in Western University, and he has a lot of experience with cleaning their 10-inch refractor at the observatory. 
And so when I started talking to him, he immediately had very much interest in this telescope as he loves antique telescopes. And so he decided to drive all the way from London, Ontario to Milton, Ontario, where I live to help me clean the telescope. And he brought with him a solution of isopropyl alcohol in distilled water. When putting it in a bath and carefully placing the lenses on top and rubbing off the dirt, it much it greatly cleaned the lens. And then after putting, um, rinsing it through with just tap water, distilled water, and isopropyl alcohol again, and finally finishing it on this 10 degree drying sand, which Henry actually made, you could see that the lenses are in much better condition. After that happened, I finally decided that I had to find out just who made this telescope. To begin, I went to one of the lar largest astronomical forums on the internet, the Cloudy Nights Forums. So if you haven't heard the Cloudy Nights Forums, it is a very large forum group where many different astronomers with a lot of experience in astronomy go to talk about various topics, one of these topics being antique telescopes. Unfortunately, they didn't have any clear answers when I talked to them about it. But one thing I did get was a referral to a different forum group, which is the Antique Telescope Society forums. So the Antique Telescope Society, as you can see in the name, is dedicated to antique telescopes. And the people there have a lot of knowledge of antique astronomers and their telescopes. And so when talking to them, I still didn't get any clear answers, although I did get very important information, such as the, the stamp that was used as a spacer, as I was unable to identify it myself, as well as finding Henry, because he was actually a member there. And on top of that, I was able to find out who made the lens of the telescope, which is actually different from the telescope maker itself. His name is John A. Brashear, by the way. He is a very notable uh, uh, lens maker in his time of the mid to late 1800s. But uh, although I didn't get any clear answer on who made the telescope, what I did get was one more referral. And that referral is to a man named Randall Rosenfeld. So Randall Rosenfeld um, runs the RSC archives, which houses a lot of information about Canadian astronomers and their telescopes. And so when talking to him, he referred me to a few pictures and people on the archives. And while I was looking through those, I had my Eureka moment. So what is this Eureka moment? Well, it is when I saw three separate pictures. This picture, this picture, and especially that picture. So when I saw this picture in particular, I immediately got a picture of my own, moved my picture around a bit, and merged them together. And as you can see here, it is a near perfect match. And so when I did that, I finally found out just who made this telescope. His name is Daniel Brand Marsh. So who is Daniel Brand Marsh? Well, he's a very important astronomer for Canada. To start, he is actually the founder of the RSC Hamilton Center, as well as the now defunct Guelph and Peterborough Centers. On top of that, he participated in many eclipse expeditions which are actually funded by the government of Canada. And, and with it, got brought a lot of important information about solar and lunar eclipses. And finally, he actually became a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, not of Canada, but the original one in Britain. So now that I finally have a name to the telescope, I decided to dig a little deeper. To start, I came across the Westfield Heritage Village. So if you haven't heard of the place, the Westfield Heritage Village houses a lot of artifacts and antique items such as buildings and tools around that area of Hamilton. And so when looking into it, I met a man named Peter Lloyd who works there, and he was very generous. So generous, in fact, he actually let me have a private tour of Marsh's telescopes as they actually loaned out some of Marsh's telescopes from the Hamilton RSC several decades ago. And with that, I brought my own telescope. And as you can see in this comparison here, it is very close to, to each other. For a comparison, mine is the one on the left. After that, I was looking around. Oh, sorry, one second. Yes, you could see here that I actually found Marsh's gravestone. And so after seeing it online, I decided to go there myself. And this is the picture I got. And if you look just very closely, 
near the top, you could see a telescope, just like the one on the picture and similar to the one I have. What's also interesting is just a five minute drive away from that cemetery is the Hamilton Public Library. Inside of their archives, they house a lot of information about Marsh, such as these two pictures here of the sun and the moon, which were most likely taken through one of these five inch telescopes. On top of that, you could see here in this article, Marsh is actually the first person ever to obtain a perfect record of a solar eclipse. And if you look at the two bottom pictures, you can see the instruments used are very similar to the telescope I have, as well as the one in the pictures. After that, I looked around on the internet some more when I came across of this old 2008 Orbit article. In it, a person was talking about, about Marsh and actually had his email at the very end asking for people to talk to him if, he has, if you have any more information about Marsh. And despite it being such an old article, his email still worked. And so the man who made that article is, uh, is Rob Allen. So Rob Allen is a member of the Hamilton RESC. And when talking to him, he had a lot of information to tell me about Marsh. But the most important thing about, about what he had was this here, a brochure. But this brochure wasn't made by Marsh. It was actually made by his son, John A. Marsh. As it turns out, his son, John A. Marsh also made telescopes with him. And on top of that, after Marsh died in 1933, his son actually made telescopes in his name that were designed to be very similar to Marsh's telescopes. So now we have the additional question of which Marsh made the telescope. And with that, we lead to our final question, which is, when was it made? Well, we have two walls of time on when this could have been made. The stamp and his death, which is 1903 to 1933. That is all the information I have on this telescope for now. Thank you very much for watching. Any questions? That's a fascinating story. Thank you for coming along and telling us all about it. No problem. Well done. Uh, questions? All right. Uh, I'll go here because it's closer. I'll be <laughs> right back. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Have you uh, considered uh, stripping off the uh, paint and restoring it to its original brass uh, finish? Yes, I have considered it, but I'm not. I'm unsure whether or not the paint's original. It's probably not, but I don't. I'm worried that if I do a permanent change like that, and it turns out that the paint's original, I don't want to. I don't really want to make changes like that. So I'll leave the paint on for now. But if if it turns out that the paint's just uh, from a previous owner, I will consider removing it. Thanks. Uh, Matteo, I'd be very interested to know whatever you find out about Marsh with the Guelph Center. The reason being is that my great-great-grandfather was the original uh, recorder for, uh, when the Guelph Center was first founded. There kind of means there's a slight possibility that there's a personal family connection with this telescope. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I got to ask more questions when we're done here. <laughs> okay, any more questions in the room? We online? Okay, let's go online then. I have one question from Leo to calf. Uh, any idea how many scopes Marsh made? Okay, so there's not an exact answer as he never really documented it, but um, a lot of people I've talked to uh, suggested there is only five of these uh, five-inch telescopes that were made, but I also saw that in, um, it, it was it's related to his son. I think um, that Orbit article I was mentioning that Rob Allen made, uh, it sounded like uh, at least his son might have made 20 of these, so five to 20 is my best guess, but there could be more or there could be less. No one knows for certain. It's just all we know for certain is that there's three of them now, two at the uh, Westfield Heritage Park and the one I have here. Okay, Matteo, I have a question myself. Uh, one of the slides, you showed something that was somewhat commercial. Were they making them commercial, commercially? Uh, like that, right uh, there. Yes, yes, so this is his, uh, Marsh's son article, John A. Marsh, and so, 
I believe that's where the uh, number 20 came from. So maybe 20 telescopes were sold using from his son after Marsh died in 1933. But I'm still not certain about that. Okay, interesting. Very good. Question right here. Did you, is his son alive? Did you try to get in touch with his son to see if there's any information from him? Uh, his son uh, passed away. I'm not sure on the year, but uh, there are still relatives al alive, I believe. Although back in the 80s, uh, there was a huge uh, like um, transfer from like uh, the family of Marsh to the Hamilton REC Center of Marsh's equipment. And then eventually that went round, wound up in the Westfield Heritage Village. So I might try contacting them one of these days. All right. Any more questions? Very good. Thanks again, Matteo. No problem. Appreciate it. All right. So we're going to go to fun facts for a minute or two uh, while we switch over to the uh, computer for our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Arnold Brody, and he'll give us an update on the Artemis uh, lunar mission. Well, thank you, Paul, and hello to everyone here tonight and those watching from home in Canada and around the world. Tonight, I'd like to give you an update on the Artemis project. Tonight, we will review what Artemis is, We'll check the results of the Artemis 1 uncrewed test flight around the moon last year, take a look at the plans for Artemis 2 crewed flight uh, around the moon in uh, 20, no, oh, that'll be in 2024, that's right. And then we will look ahead uh, to the Artemis 3 mission. That will be the return of astronauts to the moon's surface. And then we will finish with questions facing Artemis. So what is Project Artemis? It's a mission to establish permanent human presence on the moon or in orbit around it in the Gateway Lunar Orbiter. And to achieve this goal, NASA has developed the Space Launch System rocket and contracted Lockheed Martin to design and manufacture the Orion spacecraft. 
The European Space Agency contributes the European Service Module, which provides solar panels for electrical power and engines for controlling Orion's orbital maneuvers. Together, these components can transport astronauts round trip between Earth and lunar orbit. NASA has contracted SpaceX and just 45 days ago, Blue Origins to develop human landing systems for transferring astronauts from the Gateway Station down to the moon and then back up again. Eventually, in a process called pre-staging, NASA and its Artemis partners, including Canada, will send assets like shelters, rovers, energy and life support systems to help establish permanent human, a, a permanent human colony on the moon. Now, being close to home, necessities can be ferried up from Earth to keep the colony going, but the long-term objective is to develop the technologies needed to become self sustaining on the moon. We can then use what we learn and develop for colonizing Mars, which is too far for routine supply from Earth. Colonies on Mars must be self-sustaining. Many people who colonize Mars will probably stay there and produce Martians, making the human race multiplanetary. Now, I'd like to play for you a five-minute NASA video that describes NASA's vision on how Artemis will help to achieve this goal. And after the clip, we'll look at the results of Artemis 1 test flight last year. So let's roll the video. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. 
Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting Gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from Gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. I'd like to point out a few things from that video we just watched. Pre-staging is not included in any of the currently planned Artemis missions that comes much later. The HLS does not separate when leaving the moon. If it left its legs behind, it could never land again. The entire HLS must return to lunar orbit to be reusable. The lunar gateway is not fully funded and its future is uncertain. I'll get back to this under questions facing Artemis. Now, radiation is a serious problem in space. Astronauts talk about seeing flashes with their eyes closed when going to sleep. The flashes are cosmic rays making contact with their retina, which means cosmic rays are also hitting their vital organs, muscles, and brains. Astronauts receive 400 times the radiation we get on Earth. To study this problem, two torsos from Germany, one wearing radiation protection, the other without, were on board Orion. Both wore radiation sensors to measure the effectiveness of that protective vest. A third dummy was a full body human weight mannequin or moonikin named Campos in honor of Arturo Campos, who saved the crew of Apollo 13. The moonikin was fitted with sensors to measure radiation and the dynamics of launch to see how it may affect astronauts' ability to reach control screens. Lessons learned will help safe help develop safe environments for people heading to the moon and Mars. Every event was a first for the SLS and Orion, starting with the launch itself on November 16, 2022. The solid rocket boosters helped get the entire system off the ground and were exhausted and jettisoned two minutes after liftoff. The SLS booster continued to fire, putting the system into orbit, then separated and fell back to the Pacific. Next, the upper stage fired to send Orion out to the moon, then separated and fell back to the Pacific. Next, the upper stage fired to send Orion out to the moon, then separated from Orion. By the way, for the next Artemis II mission, Orion will use its own engines instead of the upper stage to leave Earth and go to the moon. 
Now, five days later, Orion reached the moon's gravity well and maneuvered into distant retrograde orbit, or DRO. On November 25, this orbit took the spacecraft farther from Earth than any previous human-rated spacecraft as it swung behind the moon. This is the image Orion took of the moon and Earth while at this farthest point. Orion took two passes around the moon before returning home, reaching its farthest from Earth on November 25, then using the second pass um, around the moon, second pass on December the 6th, yes, like a slingshot uh, that would then send it back home. Notice how the moon traveled halfway around Earth between Orion's two loops around it. Notice also that on Orion's second pass, it makes a clockwise orbit while the moon travels counterclockwise in its orbit around Earth. And because it loops around retrograde, it almost comes to a stop, as you saw there, and then falls back down to Earth on a journey that takes about five days. Let's listen to the NASA announcers describe Orion's return. This view is from one of the solar array wing or saw cameras on board the vehicle. The vehicle now over 1,680 miles away from the moon. And that small sliver towards the bottom of your screen, that's here, that's home, that's us. And that is where Orion is headed next. A half century later, NASA's newest moon explorer, the Orion spacecraft, is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit, now less than two hours away from splashing down in the Pacific Ocean west of Baja, California, to complete its shakedown mission that has opened a new era of deep space exploration. We have three fully inflated main chutes. Time to splash down 90 seconds. Splash down. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion, back on Earth. Orion is in great shape. Stable one, just in the orientation that had been expected. Now, the next time we see an Orion spacecraft bobbing in the Pacific, there will be four astronauts, three American and one Canadian, sitting behind those windows We'll talk about them in the Artemis II mission coming up in a couple of minutes. Now, for the first time in NASA history, a skip entry method of re-entering Earth's atmosphere was used. It reduces Orion's velocity through atmospheric drag as the capsule dives into the atmosphere briefly, then pulls up. This, dim, this dip in and out maneuver is entirely computer controlled using atmospheric data uploaded to it just before re-entry. And after the skip out in space, as the capsule re-enters the atmosphere, it's, go it's going slower than it would have otherwise. And that reduces the G-forces on the astronauts and reduces the heat on the heat shield because it's not traveling quite so fast. And the heat shield, of course, is the most valuable asset in the Artemis inventory. So what are the results of the Artemis I test flight? The space launch system was a pass. The SLS rocket performed with precision, meeting or exceeding all expectations. The solid rocket boosters and all of the lower and upper stage engines executed their ignitions, burns, throttle downs and back up, shutdowns and restarts perfectly. According to Artemis mission manager Mike Serafin, quote, the rocket systems performed as designed and as expected. In every case, performance was off by less than 0.3% of the 
in all cases across the board. How about the European service module? Did I go too far? Yes, I did. Okay. How about the service module? That was a pass. The uh, rockets, uh, the module's engines operated perfectly, enabling Orion to execute the distant retrograde orbit, exit the moon's gravity five days later, and direct Orion back home. The module generated 20% more power than initial expectations and consumed 25% less power than predicted. The modules are built by the European Space Agency with most of the construction in Germany with the other European countries providing the components for it. And how about the Orion capsule itself? Well, as you saw a moment ago, that was a pass. Orion accomplished 161 objectives, objectives to fully demonstrate every aspect of the spacecraft. In fact, testing went so well, NASA decided in mid-flight to test 20 additional objectives, passing them all. The onboard systems were so successful that they were removed from the Orion capsule and are being integrated into the next Orion for Artemis II. Lockheed Martin is the producer, designed and produced uh, the Orion spacecraft. And how about that computer run skip entry technique? That was a pass. The automated onboard system successfully uploaded atmospheric and weather data to calibrate the timing of the firing of Orion's thrusters, to orient the capsule's angle of descent and pitch of its shield, to execute the dip in and out of Earth's atmosphere, to reduce speed before re-entering the atmosphere for splashdown. Slower speeds also improve accuracy reaching the target splash zone, even if the zone is shifted, as we shall see. How about that heat shield? Pass. The heat of reentry did not penetrate the largest ever heat shield and destroy the capsule. The heat shield uses an ablative coating, which is designed to gradually wear away during reentry, taking the heat away with it. Post flight analysis show the coating wore away unevenly. A significant amount of the original Avcoat material remained in some places. Avcoat is the name of Lockheed Martin's ablative coating that they designed for their heat shield. And uh, that final step of splashdown, how was that? Well, that was a pass. Now, bad weather at the intended splash zone in the Pacific coast uh, off of San Diego, that forced the change to a new location 550 kilometers further south off the Baja California Peninsula of Mexico. The lower speed from the re-entry technique probably helped Orion re-aim its tra uh, trajectory and the capsule splashed down within sight of the recovery ship USS Portland, coming within four kilometers of the target, beating the mission requirement accuracy of 10 kilometers. In other words, Orion stuck the landing in spite of NASA moving the goalposts, a perfect 10. This is what mission success looks like, folks, Seraphin said. Now, the overwhelming success of Artemis I, particularly its heat shield, must be an enormous relief for the crew of Artemis II, which will launch as early as November 2024. The crew of four were, were announced back on April the 3rd. They are Victor Glover, Christina Cook, Reed Wiseman, and from Canada, terribly handsome, Jeremy Hansen. Now, as you can see, Jeremy is easily the tallest and biggest of the four. Is it just me, or does he remind you, too, of Buzz Lightyear? There's a lot to like in this foursome. We have both white and colored, male and female, and the crew includes a non-American, Another reminder, along with the European service module, that Artemis is an international effort. Let's hear a few words from these astronauts. Uh, 
I'm Christina Cook. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Jeremy Hansen. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Victor Glover. I'm the pilot. I'm Reed Wiseman. I'm the commander for the Artemis II mission to the moon. To the moon. To the moon. To the moon. When I was young, I had a poster of the Earthrise picture, the famous picture that was taken on Apollo 8. And the fact that it was a human behind the lens that made that picture so profound and changed how we all thought of our own home was so amazing to me. The moon is not just a symbol of thinking about our place in the universe. It's not just a symbol of exploration. It's actually a beacon for science. It's a beacon for understanding where we came from. You know, pushing ourselves to explore is just core to who we are. It's a part of being a human. That's our nature. We go out there and we explore to learn about where we are, why we are, understanding the big questions about our place in the universe. The exploration we're doing is the first few steps on the path of getting humans to Mars. The Artemis campaign of missions have set such an ambitious goal for humanity that it's inspiring contributions from around the globe. Not just one nation is inspired and moved by this, but nations from around the globe are coming together. When I look at the Artemis II crew with Victor, Christina, and Jeremy, they want to go do this mission. They are keenly driven. They are humble to a fault. It is so cool to be around them. Artemis II is a huge mission, but I hope we will look back and realize that this was one tiny step in humans on Mars and a sustained presence on the moon. Artemis II will be NASA's first crewed flight test of the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft around the moon. To verify today's capabilities for humans to explore deep space and pave the way for NASA's long-term human and scientific presence on the lunar surface. We are ready. We are going to the moon for all humanity. We are Artemis. This graphic shows the path the Orion capsule will take in Artemis II and 12 key steps that occur throughout the journey from liftoff to splashdown. You'll notice that Orion will orbit Earth twice for system checks before departing in step six. Also, Orion does not orbit the moon. Instead, it loops once behind the far side of the moon, then heads right back home for splashdown in the Pacific Ocean off the U.S. coast. Now let's take a look at these 12 key steps in action. Liftoff. If no problems with launch, the abort system is jettisoned and the core stage continues firing to reach low Earth orbit, then separates and falls back into the Pacific. While coasting in low Earth orbit, the solar panels unfold and are positioned before the second stage fires to raise the perigee or low point of Orion's orbit. Orion will stay in Earth orbit for 42 hours to fully demonstrate and certify the capabilities of the spacecraft's environmental control and life support system. That will be flying for the first time with a crew of four astronauts. Half an orbit later, the second stage fires again, raising Orion's speed and boosting the apogee or high point of its orbit in the direction towards the moon. The second stage separates from Orion and the two orbit side by side. Pilot Victor Glover will manually control the service module's engines to demonstrate Orion's ability to navigate precisely towards and away from the second stage and adjust the craft's orientation with it. That's imitating docking maneuvers. 
The service module has 42 small thrusters grouped into six pods that can fire individually or in tandem to move or rotate the spacecraft to any position. The maneuvering capability is needed for docking with the human landing system in Artemis III. So it's important to test this function and learn how to operate it. Now, following the test, the ESM's eight auxiliary engines fired to add more speed to Orion and raise the Apache even higher, like winding up a slingshot for a shot at the moon. During this final orbit, all remaining system checkouts are performed. The crew must complete their assessment of life support, exercise, and habitation equipment to ensure readiness before heading to the moon. If Orion receives a clean, a clean bill of health, the module's main engine will fire, sending Orion on its way. By the way, the main engine has flown to space before. It's a repurposed space shuttle orbital maneuvering engine, which can swivel in pitch and yaw. The trip to the moon takes four days. During this time, the crew will continue with exercising and testing all of Orion's life support equipment and navigating systems. They will also have time to enjoy the view of a receding Earth and a growing moon, and I can catch a quick sip of water. If all, if all course corrections are spot on, Orion will swing around the moon 7,500 kilometers above the moon's leading side in its orbit around Earth. That's a retrograde orbit sending Orion around the back of the moon in a direction opposite the moon's direction around Earth. And this causes gravitational breaking on Orion as it swings around to the other side of the moon and is flung in the direction of Earth. The Artemis crew are now on a four day trip back home. They will continue with the same tests as before and possibly more that mission planners could add on if all is going well. The crew will also have chores preparing for re-entry as they watch Earth growing ever larger. Now, before entering Earth's atmosphere, the European Space Module will separate from Orion and then it will fall back to Earth, landing in the Pacific. Some pieces may hit the water. Meanwhile, Orion performs the skip entry descent in which the astronauts experience up to four Gs of deceleration twice. It's now, we're coming in. Before the atmosphere and parachutes together will slow Orion down to 35 kilometers an hour or 20 miles an hour for those of you on the Imperial system. And then it will splash down in the Pacific. Step 12, the last step of that journey. The US Navy with NASA teammates then recover the astronauts and the Orion capsule. If all goes well, we're on to Artemis III, which will see two Americans, male and female, land near the moon's south pole. This mission introduces a new component, the lunar gateway that would already be in orbit around the moon before Artemis III launches. It also includes a second spacecraft called the Human Landing System, needed to take the astronauts down to the moon and back up again, since Orion can't do that. Only after an uncrewed starship docks with a gateway, only then would NASA send the Orion capsule with a crew of four astronauts up to the gateway to also dock with it. The crew would transfer to the gateway. A day or so later, two of them would enter the HLS to descend to the moon's south pole for a week-long stay before returning to the Gateway for a ride back home in their Orion. NASA announced their choice of SpaceX to develop a version of its Starship to serve as the human landing system. They made that announcement in this video. NASA has chosen SpaceX to return us to the moon. 
I am so excited to partner with SpaceX in this fantastic endeavor for the Artemis suite of missions. So congratulations to the SpaceX team. The SpaceX design is a single stage solution using their Starship. It provides extensive volume for the crew with two airlocks and ample down mass capability. The SpaceX proposal included in space propellant transfer demonstration and uncrewed test landing. So now that we've selected our partner and for the next phase going forward, we have to make sure that the testing occurs because we're not gonna launch humans until we have a successful test. So we will be working to make sure that uh, the design and everything that we have going forward so far is ready to go. So the human landing system is going to allow us to be able to access different parts of the lunar surface but it also allows us to explore a new technology and capabilities that will help us when we are trying to figure out our next round of technologies to be able to help us land on Mars. Landing on Mars is a strong suggestion as to why NASA picked the SpaceX design. Elon Musk is developing the Starship for travel to and landing on Mars. So by funding its development as the lander for the moon, NASA's managers, managers are simultaneously getting their Mars lander developed. But NASA is now planning to get down to the moon without the Lunar Gateway Station in Artemis III. In this Wikipedia explanation, the Starship will rendezvous, in other words, dock with the Orion capsule, and the two moonbound astronauts would transfer directly into the Starship for their trip down to the surface and back. There would be no gateway. It could be constructed later, and if it is, Canada will have an important role. We are to provide Canada Arm 3 to help with the station's construction and securing incoming vessels. It should be noted that the Starship HLS spacecraft will use up its fuel just reaching Earth orbit and will need to be refueled before heading off to the moon. SpaceX will need to put a fuel depot in Earth orbit, then launch a number of Starship tankers to fill the depot with propellants. And only then would the Starship HLS launch, dock with the depot and take on the fuel needed to reach lunar orbit and then ferry astronauts arriving on Orion down to the moon and back up again. And they could do that multiple times with a full tank. All of this draws our attention to the development of the SpaceX Starship system. Now, last April, many of us watched the SpaceX attempt their first orbital launch of a Starship stacked on top of its booster stage that's powered by 33 Raptor engines. Now, the test uh, Starship failed to separate from the booster and the whole system was purposely detonated three or four minutes after launch while over the Gulf of Mexico. Clearing the launch tower was the only achievement. So pressure is on and SpaceX will need to make significant progress quickly in order to pull off an automated uncrewed landing of a starship up on the moon and return to lunar orbit before Artemis III can launch. Now, two months ago, NASA selected Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin Aerospace Company to provide a second human landing system known as the Blue Moon HLS. It is to be the moon lander and return to lunar orbit spacecraft used in Artemis V, and that's planned for 2029. Blue Horizon's New Glenn heavy launch vehicle is currently under development, and that's what will propel this HLS up into lunar orbit. Now, there are interesting questions facing Artemis, such as, is there a need for the Lunar Gateway at all. Doug Cook, former NASA Associate Administrator said, NASA can significantly increase speed, simplicity and cost and probability of mission success by deferring gateway and reduce, reducing critical mission operations. George Abbey, former director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, the gateway is in essence building a space station to orbit a natural space station, namely the moon. 
if we're going to go return to the moon, we should go directly there. Not build a station, station, <laughs> space station to orbit it. René Wachlavisek, on designing the gateway, he noted that there was difficulty in designing comfortable living quarters. He was forced to shrink the module's diameter to just 1.2 meters. That, that's because of the limited weight that we can currently launch into lunar orbit. Most of the habitat's eight cubic meters of available space will be filled with with um, support equipment, and that leaves a total of only 1.5 cubic meters of space, personal space, to be shared by four astronauts. Robert Zerbin, president of the Mars Society, calls the Gateway a dangerous experiment exposing humans and equipment to high doses of cosmic radiation outside of low Earth orbit for the dubious scientific purpose of figuring out how to endure it on long duration space flight. That would amount to unethical medical research. He says it's like shooting your own soldiers to study wound pathology. Rene dismisses the gateway as NASA's latest jobs program, a boondoggle of sorts for longtime aerospace partners. He calls it a lunar orbit toll booth. And another question, is there even a need for the SLS and Orion? By using the existing International Space Station as a transfer hub, instead of building one to orbit the moon, NASA could send its moonbound astronauts up there aboard a Crew Dragon, like we do now for ISS crews. Space, SpaceX launches the Starship HLS. It is refueled and docks at the ISS. The moonbound astronauts transfer to the Starship. The Starship takes the astronauts to the moon and lands there. After they complete their exploration, the Starship returns the astronauts to the ISS, where they transfer back to the Dragon for the return to Earth, uh, with the uh, capsule closed, I would imagine. Then it's a simple case of repeat. Because the components are largely reusable, including the Falcon 9 rocket used for launching the Dragon, sending more astronauts to the moon it is a simple, low-cost repeat. And this eliminates the cost of single-use space launch systems, the Orion capsules, and the Lunar Gateway. When will Starship fly? As we saw, Artemis depends on the Starship HLS to take astronauts down to the moon. And Artemis 3 is currently scheduled for launch in December 2025, according to their website, which is only 30 months from now. SpaceX must, must complete an autonomous landing of a Starship on the moon's surface and relaunch to lunar orbit before Artemis 3 can launch. The first orbital test flight of Starship and Booster back in April failed. The second attempt is planned for next month. There will be a lot riding on this second attempt. SpaceX also needs to develop the depot and tanker variants of the Starship, the technology to transfer propellants in Earth orbit, and demonstrate their ability to catch returning spacecraft with the launch tower chopsticks in order to quickly relaunch those tankers and their boosters. Can SpaceX accomplish all of this in 30 months? Probably not. And Artemis 3 is likely to slide into 2026. Many website sources already say 2026. If Artemis stalls while waiting for Starship, a lack of launch cadence leads to a loss of talent. Some may be assigned to other projects or laid off. Some may pursue opportunities elsewhere. There will be hiccups getting new people trained and up to speed. With significant turnover comes increased risks. 
if Artemis stalls, there could be public skepticism, a drop of interest, maybe questions regarding NASA's vision or leadership. And that brings with it a risk of losing congressional funding, especially if an anti-science Congress gets selected as well as losing international support if partners abandon Artemis to take on other projects. So what have we learned? Well, Artemis I was a big success. Artemis II with four astronauts on board, including Canadian Jeremy Hansen, will loop around the moon currently planned for November of 2024. Artemis will land a man and woman on the moon, planned for December 25, with a starship from SpaceX serving as the lander. There will not be a gateway involved at this time. And as we saw, the project depends on Starship. And we also saw a number of questions facing the Artemis, such as why the lunar gateway and we also saw the difficulty Starship is having getting its act, getting its ship off of the Earth. In summary, as we celebrate the success of Artemis I, and as we look forward to Artemis II crewed mission, flight around the moon in November next year, we must also keep in mind that there are significant questions facing Artemis that can lead to rethinking the missions or at least significant delays going forward. And that's all I've got for tonight. Are there any questions? This presentation, Arnold, that was really, really good. Appreciate it. Very good. Uh, questions in the room. Here we go, Frank. So uh, a quick question regarding the um, Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft uh, heat shield ablation, which you pointed out was um, uh, ablated unevenly. So do you have any more information to share about that? For example, I, was it um, expected to or, unex or not expected to ablate unevenly? Um, I, I, I checked to see, is that really a problem and could not find any conclusive uh, dialogue about that. The only conclusion I can come up with is if it wore away unevenly there was more left than they expected i gather that's a good thing that it didn't wear away too much if i were going to be writing in artemis 2 i want that ablative coating not to wear away altogether so if it wears away less rapidly than predicted then it's probably pretty good that would be my take but i couldn't find de definitive uh discussion about that Okay, any more questions in the room? Online. I could, oh, by the way, I could add one more tidbit. Uh, in that video we saw towards the beginning, it, they said the SLS is the most powerful rocket ever. Well, that was until that test flight back in April of, of Starship. Uh, this, uh, the booster with its 33 Raptor engines generates not quite twice, let's say 75% more thrust than the SLS. Okay, so oh, there's a question right on the other side. Um, how did they select the, the landing location on the moon? They wanted to go to the South Pole so they could take a look at the uh, permanent water ice that is in the permanently shadowed craters of the South Pole. They want to get down there uh, and maybe grab some samples. I don't know if they're bringing anything back, but at least get down there and study the location um, because that's where it's more than likely that a, a Mars colony will be built because you need that water uh, for self-sustaining environment and also for rocket fuel. So the South Pole is most interesting. Oh, I should also add that the Chinese said they're going to go to the moon and have a colony as well. They want to get there by 2030. And there's a rare uh, mineral on the moon that is a thousand times more prevalent than it is found on Earth. And it's a, a form 
uh, I forget the name of the uh, chemical, but it's used in fusion technology. So there's keen interest in going to the moon for those resources. So there's a race on now, now with China. It was against the Soviet Union back in the 1960s, 70s. Now the race is with China. For that, are there plans to go to other locations in the future? There could be. I mean, once they have the technology in orbit to go up and down, they mentioned in one of those videos that the one of the advantages of the uh, lunar gateway is that it can drop people off at any location around the moon. The same is true if you have a starship serving as the orbital gateway. It could be doing the same distant uh, orbit or the same um, re rectilinear orbit, they call it SRO. Uh, I forget the name of that orbit, but the spacecraft, the Orion, uh, the, the, the starship could imitate what the lunar gateway would have been doing. So it could also drop off astronauts anywhere they want to on the moon. So if there's an interest in let's explore this area for its minerals, that's maybe up at the equator or at the north end of the pole, they can do it. That's one of the advantages of this orbit is that it gives you a shot at any part of the moon that you may want to go to. The keen interest now is the South Pole, but I'm sure they want they want to land elsewhere. Any more questions? Yes, Frank. Well, it was a great presentation, just like the, the other two earlier this evening. And so just as a suggestion, rather than a question, it would be great if you could uh, put together a, a presentation about the Chinese lunar uh, lunar um, uh, project in the future. I'll take that on as a challenge. Can you find such information? Maybe. It <laughs> might be a short presentation, Frank. I don't know. All right. Any other questions? We're good? All right. So thanks again, Arnold. Maybe from the uh, chat window? No, no questions. No questions. No okay. questions there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks again, Arnold. All right. So that concludes, that concludes our speakers for this evening. Uh, we have announcements. Uh, but before we get to the announcements, we'll go to fun times for uh, switch over equipment. Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers. Uh, very interesting theme tonight we've had. We've had astronomy present, we've had astronomy past, and we've had astronomy future. So uh, let's get on to the announcements. So uh, we've got two types of meetings here at the Science Center. You've just seen one of our recreational astronomy nights, and we also have speaker nights, which will be starting up again uh, in the fall after the summer break. 
For those of you who are uh, joining us live on YouTube, thank you very much for doing so. And uh, please uh, say hello. Uh, the next time you're around, uh, please enter some questions for the presenters like uh, some others have done so far tonight. If you're a new member, please uh, introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, like Patagonia, please let us know where you're coming from. So our next recreational astronomy night is on the 2nd of August, 7.30 p.m. Uh, in person here at the Science Center and online at YouTube. Uh, Claudio Oriani will be discussing the sky this month. Ralph Chu will be talking about a visit to the Perth Observatory in Australia. And Frank Dempsey will be talking about forecasting the location of wildfire smoke. Uh, thanks, Frank. <laughs> And as Paul Markov pointed out earlier, um, if you've got something you'd like to present, uh, please drop them a line. And as I said earlier, our speaker's nights are on hold for the summer. We'll see you in September. So solar observing is going to be happening here at the Ontario Science Centre this Saturday, uh, July 8th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, the volunteers will be set up uh, just outside the front door. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at the sun uh, through filter telescopes. Uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, the event is free. Uh, this is a weather dependent event. So uh, please check our website for a go, no go call uh, before heading over to the Science Center. Coming up on Friday, the 21st of July at Millennium Square is another public stargazing session. Hopefully this one will not be clouded out uh, from 7 p.m. to midnight. Join us for an evening of free public stargazing along the North Shore of Lake Ontario, Millennium Square, uh, observing the moon and stars through our telescopes. Uh, please bring along a telescope if you have one, and we can give you a hand uh, setting it up and aiming it at the moon. Uh, just a reminder that uh, please dress for cooler temperatures down by the lake, and we are still recommending wearing masks. Uh, please check our website for a go, no-go decision based on the weather before heading down to the square. Now, we've got quite a bit coming up at the DDO, the David Dunlop Observatory, in the next little while. Uh, there's an astronomy family night on Friday, July 7th, uh, from 10 p.m. to midnight. Uh, cost is up to the age of 14 is $15.69, and for 15 or over, it's $17.72. Links and registration can be found, uh, sorry, you have to register online. The links to the registration can be found on our website, rasco.ca. Uh, coming up on jo uh, Saturday, Sunday, July 9th, 12.30 to 1 p.m. is Sunday Sun Gazing at the DDO. Uh, $10 for 7 to 14-year-olds and over 15, 11.30. Again, registration is online. Links can be found on our website. Uh, DDO Stargazing Night is the first clear night of July 24th to 28th. So the first and only uh, the first clear night, and even if there's more than one clear night, it's just the first one. Um, starting at sunset, bring your own binoculars, no registration required, just show up. And the next uh, DDO Astronomy Speakers Night is Saturday, July 29th, 9.30 to 11.30 p.m. Uh, at the DDO. Quinton Weirich will be discussing taking back the night sky, what we can do about light pollution. Uh, 1569 for those under the age of 14, 1772 for those over the age of 15. Again, registration required. Links can be found at rasto.ca. Now, uh, observing sessions for our City Star party, party, we are launching a pilot project uh, to find a, another uh, city stargazing site. So on the first clear night of July 15th, 16th, 22nd or 23rd, whichever is the first clear night, uh, folks will be uh, meeting at Long Branch Park for a pilot project to see the feasibility of this event, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, more details on the website. And again, uh, check for a go or no-go decision based on the weather. Okay, Saturdays and Sundays. And then uh, Bayview Village Park, our regular uh, City Star Party, is going on. It's the first clear night of July 24th to 27th, except for Wednesday night of that week. So the Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, whichever is the first one that's clear, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m.
Again, check our website for go, no go decisions. Uh, the CAO is open and we'd love for you to use it. We are mostly uh, done with, pre, with uh, pandemic conditions. There are a few exceptions. We are still asking for, we still have a, the exception includes a, a maximum of two unrelated persons per bedroom who mutually agree to share that room. Um, masking in common areas is still encouraged, but the preference of the people who are staying there uh, will be taken. Uh, public outreach events, favorable moon phase, supervised weekends throughout the summer and the fall have resumed. Full details are on the RASC web, RASCTO website at the CAO bookings page. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to announce that we have a new treasurer for the Toronto Centre. Uh, after a long spell through some difficult times, Adrian Aberdeen is stepping down and uh, he has left some very large shoes to fill. Um, Adrian has gotten us through the last few years, which have not been the easiest. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that Dennis Gray will be uh, taking over the role. Uh, Dennis has recently completed our website upgrade. Uh, if you've been playing around and with our website, um, please join me in both thanking Adrian for all of his hard work and well, we can decide congratulations or condolences to Dennis, depending on your opinion. Now, uh, job board. Uh, before we get into this, as you may have been a longtime member, uh, several folks here have volunteer badges. Um, some of these are in need of updating. Uh, to be fair, it, we were closed down for a couple of years, so we didn't really get much done. Um, to be honest, I still don't have mine that says president. Uh, so what we're doing is if you are a regular volunteer, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, we need your name so that we can get you a badge. If you currently, if you still have your old one, the design will not change. And if it's in good shape, um, there's really no need to get a replacement. But if you need a new one because either your role in the center has changed over the last couple of years, or if yours has worn out, or if in the last couple of years it's sort of disappeared on you, or you're a new member, or any other reason that I can't think of off the top of my head, please uh, get in touch with me at presidents at restio.ca. A uh, couple of notes. Um, we're still looking for an education and public outreach chair. Uh, we're still looking for a volunteer committee chair, and we're still looking for a marketing committee chair and some members to form a proper marketing committee. Um, as well, the education and public outreach, we could use some additional committee members, especially online presenters and telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Uh, a reminder that in order to volunteer, you first must be a member. Reach out to myself at president at rasto.ca. A uh, quick plug for the plug for the joys of membership. Uh, you can renew if you like what you've seen here and would like to know more and like to join us on our zany adventures. Um, you can renew, sign up online at the national website, secure.rask.ca. Uh, gift memberships are also available. For those details, contact the national office at mempub at rask.ca. For those of you here uh, in the audience, I'd like to invite you to what some consider the most important part of the evening, the meeting after the meeting. We uh, assemble at the Granite Brew Pub on the corner of Eglinton and Mount Pleasant, 245 Eglinton East, uh, if you need to plug that into a device. Uh, parking is free uh, at an underground access is off of Mount Pleasant. We are usually in the front room. And for everyone else, both here and online, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media that we've got listed here. If you've been watching us live on YouTube, uh, please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell if you like what you saw. Um, be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everyone.